we now are going to do the second part of the, the, the Goya series. Uh, it's, let me make sure that window disappears. Um, this is going to be a heavy class because this is the Goya that everybody knows. Uh, so we'll go quickly back through uh, his uh, biography. He was born in Aragon in 1746, the son of a gilder. He apprenticed with uh, Jose Luzan in Zaragoza. Uh, in 69, he wasn't very successful early on. He went to Italy in 69 and came back to Zaragoza with some palms. He, he had done some works in Italy that made him uh, known. In 1773, he married uh, Josefa, who was the uh, Francisco Bayeux's sister. Francisco Bayeux was also from Saragossa, um, but was a much more renowned uh, painter. And we'll see, uh, he is going to actually influence uh, Goya's career quite a bit. Uh, Josefa and um, Francisco had 10 ch children of only one survived. Poor uh, Josefa, she was really weakened by all these uh, pregnancy, pregnancies. Uh, in 1775, he went to Madrid and worked for his brother-in-law, who was at that time a court painter. Uh, Francisco Bayeux became in charge of the Royal Tapestry Factory and hired Goya, among others, to make cartoons. And when I talk about cartoons, these are not uh, funnies. They are actually uh, the paintings that serve as model for the tapestry weavers that they use under the loom or behind the loom, depending on how the loom is vertical or horizontal. Uh, to uh, reproduce the design of the painter. In 1780, he was elected to the Royal Academy of San Fernando in Madrid, which was quite important, and became nine years later a court painter to the new King Charles IV, who he, he had met uh, for quite a while. Unfortunately, in 1792, while he was in Sevilla, uh, an illness, a really severe illness, uh, left him stone deaf, but also um, had recurrent problems during his life after that. This is going to have, as you can imagine, a tremendous impact on his character and his outlook at life. He made the series, the famous series of Los Caprichos, uh, made of 82 plates uh, from 1793 to 98, and we'll see these. In 1795, he succeeded Bayeux as director of painting at the Academy of San Fernando. And then in 99, was appointed first court painter which is something he was dying to become. He was quite ambitious, uh, and, uh, but the way the uh, nomination were taking place was really by uh, seniority. And so finally it was his time. Between 1810 and 14, he made the, the 65 etchings called the, the Los Desastres de la Guerra, the disasters of war, and we'll see these too. In 1819, he decided to go a little outside of the center of Madrid and bought a country house in the outskirt of the, the city called the Quinta del Sordo, the house of the deaf man. It didn't actually uh, come from his deafness, but rather from a previous owner who was also deaf, but was full, he fell ill again and again. Uh, the year after, he executed 14 large murals known as the black paintings on the walls of that famous uh, house. And you can imagine how funny the interior must have been. Uh, from 1815 to 23, he made another series only from 18 etchings plus four that came later called Los Disparates or Proverbios or Sueños. It has different names. 
uh, in, in 1824, he decided he just couldn't take it. And he was fearing for his life uh, because he had uh, been working for the French king at the time. Uh, he was concerned that uh, he was going to get some consequences. And so he decided to move to Bordeaux in France. Though for him, it was always a real hardship because he was very deeply Spanish and couldn't live away from Spain. So he did a few trips uh, back and forth. Uh, in 1826, he finally officially resigned as a court painter and died in Bordeaux in 1828. Here is a self-portrait of Goya at the beginning of his career. And then this is a mature work uh, towards the end. The, as I mentioned, the fact that um, his disease was, was a real problem. We're not sure at all what was the, the cause of that disease. Some people say that it could be lead poisoning. But lead poisoning was very, very frequent with uh, painters, you know, who might just chew on, on the butt of their, their uh, brushes. Uh, and of course, a lot of uh, the pigments at that time, particularly white, was based on lead. And this was highly poisonous. Uh, he became very withdrawn and introspective. What was interesting is that be because he was the court painter at that time, if he wanted to leave Madrid, he had to get the permission of the king. And he had uh, actually uh, said that he was going to go to Seville. Got more or less a permission, but it wasn't quite clear. And um, but ran out of money and so had to ask money to the Duke of Osuna, who was one of his protector, what, pretending to be in Madrid when he was already in Sevilla. When he fell ill in Sevilla, uh, some friends that lived in Cadiz at the end of at the, the mouth of the Guadalquivir River um, invited him to go and uh, be taken care of uh, over there, which he uh, did. But he almost died, was temporarily paralyzed, and son, uh, lost the sense of balance. He made a few uh, portraits uh, during this one. This is uh, the portrait of Martin Sabater, who was no, um, uh, born in uh, Saragossa, also had been in elementary school with uh, Goya and became a lifelong friend. Uh, the man was actually a pretty rich um, merchant uh, dealer who had very ideas that were very close to the Enlightenment. They had a uh, pretty uh, broad correspondence during that time, which is a very rich uh, uh, document, uh, uh, documentation for us to understand better the uh, Goya. He made another portrait of uh, here, Sebastian Martinez, uh, who was an art collector in an estate. He, was, he had cosmopolitan and modern taste and was uh, part of a um, uh, progressive merchant class. He, this is uh, with Sebastian Martinez that he stayed in uh, the house in uh, Cadiz when he was really uh, sick. The letter that uh, Sebastian holds in his uh, hand reads, Don Sebastian Martinez by his friend Goya in 1792. He had a great collection uh, of uh, books, prints and paintings and uh, was named the chief treasurer of the finance committee of Cadiz. We have to remember that once uh, the Guadalquivir was tilted in uh, Seville, the, uh, the great, the, the center for uh, the naval uh, fl fleet in uh, Spain became Cadiz and that had direct uh, contact with the Atlantic Ocean. This portrait was actually painted around 1792 
just before Goya contracted the uh, illness. Uh, an important thing about Sebastian Martinez, as I mentioned, he had a great collection of art, including some of the plates of the prison, the Carcieri uh, by Piranesi, the great 18th century uh, printer, engraver, uh, who uh, had a tremendous imagination and made these uh, fictional prisons that were absolutely out of range of the human scale, if you want. And I think this is uh, going to be of great influence on uh, Goya, just the technique and some of the uh, absolutely crazy inspiration of Piranesi is going to influence the way uh, Goya is going to work on prints. He also made another portrait of his uh, brother-in-law, Francisco Bayeux, uh, who was also a former teacher. And this is very typical of the palette that Goya was using at the time, which was, had a predominance of gray and silvery tones. Just to come back to something we looked at last time, we have to understand the, the big shift between the two uh, dynasties. Uh, we had seen for two centuries the dynasty of the Habsburg, uh, that finished with Carlos II, as you can see, Carlos II, unable to have uh, children, was totally inbred, uh, suffered from all kinds of ailments because of uh, very heavy inbreeding. Uh, and therefore, he was succeeded by a Bourbon from the French uh, royal family, Philippe V, who was the younger brother of Dauphin Louis, uh, Dauphin Louis, who died before his grandfather. Uh, so Philip V that we see here um, became king of Spain. And this uh, went, uh, was pretty difficult to accept by the, the Spaniards because suddenly you had that uh, French style uh, and taste were imposed on them by the king. The king had with his first wife, Maria Luisa of Savoy, uh, four children, Louis I, but who didn't uh, only reign for a few months uh, when his father abdicated in 1724. He, um, he died of uh, smallpox and the, Philip V had to come back to the throne and it's only in 1746 at his death that Fernando VI uh, succeeded to him. But Fernando died without children. And so it is the eldest son of Philip V's second wife, Elizabeth Farnese, Carlos III, who succeeded uh, finally to him. Uh, Carlos III was king when Goya started his career. Uh, he had contact with him and made a lot of work for him, lots of cartoons for tapestries. Uh, but during that time, had met the heir to the throne, Carlos IV, and his wife, Maria Luisa, who was a very important figure in uh, the, the Spanish court. So Maria Luisa was a strong woman, uh, very strong character. Carlos IV was a rather weak person, rather uh, hunting the taking care of uh, the affair of states. And we'll see what role Maria Luisa is going to play. Important too is then uh, the son Fernando VII is going to succeed, but at that time we have to remember that uh, comes the French Revolution uh, in, in France. And uh, after, in the middle of, of let's say, about uh, 10 years after the French Revolution, we had the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte. And Napoleon had his eyes on Spain. That was a really nice territory to have. So he fooled Fernando VII in saying, you know, you should invade Portugal and let me help you. In doing so, he uh, had a whole troop, a large troop of uh, soldiers that came into the country and what he did is he actually invaded uh, Spain too. 
And uh, finally, not happy with Fernando, put his own brother Joseph um, on the helm, to the helm of the country. When Joseph had to leave in 13, Fernando will come back until 33, and we'll see the impact on that. Carlos III was a very good king, though he was a absolute monarch, but he was uh, what you called an enlightened uh, absolute monarch. He uh, did a lot and tried to do a lot to modernize the country. Unfortunately, his son didn't have that vision and uh, dismantled a lot of things that the king had done. So let's look at these people a little closer. Very quickly, when uh, Charles IV of Spain, or Carlos IV, either one, uh, became a king, his wife played quite a role. You see her across uh, the Queen Maria Luisa. These are both details of official portraits, equestrian portrait uh, by Goya. And what happened is that a very intriguing person came in on the scene. It's, I'm talking about Manuel Godoy, the Duke of Alcudia. Uh, he was nicknamed the Prince of the Peace. And what happened is that uh, the Queen Maria Luisa and Godoy had a very close relationship, very, very close, if you see, if you see what I mean. So um, they actually are the one <coughs> who are going to direct the country. Goya was uh, asked to come to uh, the palace of El Bue de Retiro multiple times to sketch uh, all the figures that will appear on this painting. And it's uh, really uh, interesting to see when we see that painting there, we see how did they ever let him uh, do that? you know, uh, finish that as an official painting. They didn't see themselves. They actually, what <clears throat> the way Goya portrayed them, uh, pleased them. You have here uh, a royal group that is, in a sense, inspired by Velázquez Las Meninas. Uh, as you can see, um, uh, Goya is portraying himself behind the easel there on the back. But here, the the uh, people are really put at the front. There is no particular order. There is no um, ceremonial uh, composition. It's it's a rather informal uh, illusion, and it's the king and the and the queen with all their family, including the future heir that you can see here on the left, uh, the future Ferdinand the Seventh. The two figures, one with the turned head and the one that appears here, obviously must not have been uh, in the Del Buen Retiro when uh, Goya made the sketching. And so this is why they appear there, but they're not quite visible. As you can see, it is not Charles who is uh, the center of the, the image, but it's Maria Luisa, definitely. Uh, you can see her jewels and the beautiful gown, uh, but where she was rather cute when she was young, she didn't age very well. While he was recovering from his illness, uh, he occupied himself with a series of cabinet painting. So the painting we saw before, the, uh, the portrait of the, the royal family was done before he was ill. But so during his recovery, he decided to make a whole series of paintings that he then sent to the Academy and uh, that are actually uh, composed of different themes. Definitely the Toromasha was something that he uh, very much liked. He's represented a few times uh, being part of some exercise with balls. In this case, it's not a, a very positive image as you can see uh, here, the picador caught by the bull. In fact, you have the picador here on the horns, literally a gourd. You can see the, the, the top of the, sorry, of the, the horn coming through his buttock. But you see also that the, the horse, uh, the white horse there has been gored by the, the bull.
Very different is that far at night. So as I mentioned, these are very diverse themes. Uh, this in is interesting too, because if you look on the label, this is all on tin plate. Uh, this is some of the um, ex experiment that Goya went through trying to paint on different surfaces. Uh, we've seen in the 16th century that interest that was on different surfaces that could be either marble, alabaster, uh, but also copper, which took off as a very good um, surface, uh, allowing for lots of details. And a tin plate would have been uh, pretty similar. So among the themes that he used for these paintings going, going to the academy were fires, shipwreck, we'll see highway robberies and also uh, lunatics in a courtyard. So you can see how the mood has changed. It's a, not as, as bright and pretty as what we saw in his, the cartoons, I think, but this is rather dark and, and uh, sad stories. Here's the yard of the madhouse, also on a tin plate, as you can see. So this is one of the scenes that Goya had recorded, he had actually witnessed. Uh, and he's going to reuse sometimes that, uh, these images, uh, which is interesting, all these fights between these men who were in the nude, they, uh, unfortunately, this is a madhouse, had become a spectacle for uh, many of the guards. This one, by the way, was rediscovered only in 1967. In the uh, robbery, again, a dark subject, uh, a lot of gores, but you can see how the palette is very dark. This is something that is going to be uh, repeated. He was using that all that earth tone uh, pigment, as you can see rather heavily, you can see in pastel here on the, the center of the cloud. And the few um, brighter colors or even the white were applied with a palette, not with a brush, with a knife, not the palette, sorry, with a knife. He made uh, some uh, lovely portrait though in 1794, by that time he had recovered, but as I mentioned, that disease is going to follow him and he will have recurring problems. Some of the lovely portraits that he made, uh, the first one, the Countess del Carpio, Marquesa de la Solana, uh, was uh, a, a woman that he had learned to know was quite uh, cultured. Um, and unfortunately, in this portrait, you can see her very thin face and pale complexion actually announces that she's close to death. Uh, she seems to be feverish in just the, the nervousness in the, the composure, if you want. Very slender silhouette. Um, she wrote poetries that were actually printed in 1783. As you can see, none of uh, Goya's models are smiling. That was not his purpose. The second portrait, La Tijana, is in fact the actress Maria del Rosario Fernandez, uh, known as La Tijana, the tyrant, literally, was married uh, to an actor, Francisco Castellanos, who was nicknamed himself El Tijano. So they must have been very strong personalities. The last portrait there on the right uh, shows uh, Mariana Waldstein, who was the Marquesa de Santa Cruz, she was originally Austrian and was one of the most prominent uh, women in the late 18th century uh, Spain. She actually uh, became by marriage the Duchess of Alba's aunt and an intimate of uh, Lu uh, Lucia Bonaparte. But of course the main uh, woman at that period in Goya's life is the Duchess of Alba. They had a very uh, close and lasting friendship. Uh, they, she actually took care of him uh, when uh, he was ill, took very nice care and arranged for him to be uh, comfortable. 
she was the last of an old noble line and very famous uh, for her beauty, wit, and intelligence. The first portrait on the left uh, shows her with full figure uh, and seems to be a, a portrait to thank her for uh, the care that she, he, uh, she took uh, for him. He is actually, uh, he wrote a dedication written in the sand and you can see it here, it's difficult to read, but it reads, a la Duquesa de Alba, Francisco de Goya, 1795. Um, she also wears a band on her wrist here uh, that uh, also bears his initials. She was a widow, by the way, by that time. She had become a widow rather uh, early, never had children, just an adopted girl, uh, and was known to live her life very freely. As you can see, the uh, palette is reduced to just a few colors. The landscape is rather bare. And uh, this is very typical of the rather simple background for uh, Goya's um, portraits. Actually, Goya kept that painting intending never to part from, uh, with it. Here is a detail. You can see the text, A la Duquesse d'Alba. Uh, Francisco de Goya and a lovely little dog with a red knot on his tail. Opposite to that one is the more, more known uh, portrait of the Duchess of uh, Alba. There she's dressed in black lace and the motto to which she points actually betrays their relationship and at the bottom there is written Solo Goya, which means only Goya, which gives us an idea of their relationship. This was painted while in San Luca. The Duchess died pretty young at the age of 40 uh, in under somewhat uh, mysterious circumstances. It looks like um, the obvious would be that she died of complication due to tuberculosis and a fever. But there is a theory that she was poisoned. After her death, that she was the last one of the, the, with the, the title of the Duke of Alba, it passed to a relative, Carlos Miguel Fitzjames Stuart, who became the 14th Duke of Alba. And uh, for those of you that follow the, uh, the news, the last Duchess of Alba died a few years ago and she was quite a phenomenon, had gone through so many uh, surgeries uh, that uh, she had become one of the ugliest women that uh, you could ever see. Two of the no most known masterpieces of Goya also uh, seem to uh, include the presence of the Duchess of Alba. And I'm talking of the two ma Maras. Uh, he made two paintings, the nude Maha, and uh, so the, the La Maha Desnuda uh, that you see here. And there's been a lot of um, uh, ideas and, and theories about who it, was, who it was represented. Because if you look at it, and try to compare it with the last nude that was painted in Spain at that time by Velázquez, the Rockaby Venus, this has absolutely no uh, excuse of being a mythological subject. She's no Venus and she's looking at you. It makes you quite understand that she's the, just there to be uh, admired. Many people consider that this nude was in fact the Duchess of Alba on which he put the head of another woman so not to uh, ridicule the, the, the Duchess. Actually, that painting was by that time a commission by the minister Godoy, uh, who had quite a good relationship with the Duchess too. And so that painting uh, was known, had been recorded in an apartment or in a cabinet of Godoy, where he was holding pictures of various Venuses, one by Goya, 
but also the famous uh, Venus by Velasquez, which has become known as the Huckabee Venus from a, a later English owner. It's, it's absolutely beautiful because the body is so soft, the curves are beautiful, and then the white pillows and the, the um, uh, bed sheet, uh, that silverish white uh, really enhance the body. And then of course, some of the teal cushions at the back are very beautiful. This would of course absolutely shock uh, any person in uh, Spanish society and of course, uh, the Inquisition, as you can imagine, which it actually is going to end up, he's going to be uh, forced to go and testify in front of the, the Inquisition later on because of having painted uh, this painting. The second one, and that one is less documented, is called La Maja Vestida, the closed Maja. Uh, and uh, this one we have less ideas. You can see the pose is exactly the same, the face is the same too, but now uh, the uh, Maha is dressed up and this would have been painted after the Duchess of Alba died and maybe he decided so that uh, kind of a remorse, he uh, closed her up. And as I mentioned, on the 16th of May, 1815, the artist was summoned to appear before a tribunal to identify them and to declare if they are where his work, uh, for declare for what reason he had painted them and uh, by whom they were commissioned and what were his intention. Uh, at that, we unfortunately don't have uh, the detail of what Goya mentioned and we knew that by that time Godoy uh, was away. He is going to paint a series of uh, paintings that have to do with witchcraft and these were actually for the uh, nice country house of the Duke and the Duchess, Duchess of Osuna. For him, he had worked uh, quite a bit. The, the, that building was called the Alameda. Uh, the subjects are similar to something we'll see later on in the Los Caprichos uh, scenes of uh, witchcraft. They, they were some uh, old superstitious heathen cult. Uh, this is the cult of Pan that was actually persecuted by the church, but still persisted in the remote corners of the country. And Goya really resented these uh, superstitions because they were the cause of many deaths and, and stupidities. Uh, so what we see here is among a group of fanatic and uh, very credulous women uh, sits a huge ram. And the ram was uh, the uh, symbol for witches at that time. As you can see, he's demanding one of the children is sacrificed and the old woman is uh, pushing the kid. You can see how very skinny that poor kid is and uh, next to the women down there is just the corpse of a dead child. Uh, in the sky you have the moon and you have a swarm of bats that of course enhance the idea of witchcraft. Of course, uh, what you see there is all these symbols point to the uh, Spanish Inquisition. Another of these paintings show witches in the air. Uh, the women there are sucking the blood of the corpse, the, the body that they hold in the hands that is either dead or dying. And then you have a man uh, with a cloth over his head, he's making a sign with both hands to ward off evil spirits. One more, this is still the uh, series for the Alameda of the Duke of Osuna, uh, The Bewitched Man. Uh, you can see here in the corner down below the Lam Desco, which means Lampaja Descomunal. Uh, it's uh, extraordinary, it's translated extraordinary lamp. 
it, it identifies the subject as a scene from a play, El Hechizado por Fuerza, The Man Bewitched by Force, that was a play by Antonio de Zamora. Uh, the protagonist is Don Claudio, that you see here, believes that he's bewitched and that his life depends on keeping a lamp alight. So he's pouring oil in that lamp. The lamp is held by a goat that is just a prop for the theater. So this is really showing actually a stage uh, with the theater. Uh, and uh, you have at the back some dancing donkeys in as a black cloth, back cloth, sorry. But then some of uh, these paintings also, by the way, on uh, tin plate, just show some uh, anecdotal themes like uh, strolling players, uh, where you have a series of people that are making some um, comedy for the people down below. So uh, just a, a dwarf and other uh, figures, Arlequin, doing a play for the people. Before I'm entering the, the, the whole series of um, etchings by uh, Goya, I want to give you a little idea of some of the terms I'm going to use. Uh, how is etching different to engraving, for example? Engraving was the direct um, engraving process, if you want, from the artist with the buren into the copper, so a rather uh, it's not a very soft metal, and so it's a more difficult uh, process than etching, whereas with the etching, you coat the copper plate with a thin layer of acid-resistant ground. And then in that uh, ground, you scratch lines, exposing the copper underneath. When you're done with your designs, you place the plate into an acid solution, which is going to bind the unprotected copper. And the lines that the artist has exposed uh, are going to become grooves deep enough to hold ink. And then you just uh, push the ink into the grooves, clean the plate, and uh, put it under the press. So this is a much easier process because the, that acid-resistant ground is soft and you can really draw uh, very easily. Uh, Goya is going to bring that uh, technique that actually had been used by many before him, and we can talk about uh, Dürer early on, but definitely Rembrandt was one of the great uh, masters into etching. But uh, what's going to happen with uh, Goya, he's going to use uh, new techniques, we'll see in a minute. The dry point is something that was used very early on, where the artist pushes the copper to build up a bridge. He's using, you know, the, the a particular tool that creates that burr alongside the carved line. And so that burr ends up holding the ink once you ink the plate, and it results in a blurred printing that is very distinguishable from a clean and precise etched line. The aqua tint is really what made Goya uh, very famous. You apply fine particles of acid resistant resin to the plate. You place the plate into the acid solution, which is going to bind the plate in the areas unprotected by the resin. And this is going to give you a lot of tones to the print. So we'll have a lot of tones in the background that looks like salt, for example. Uh, very dotted uh, texture. The lavis is pretty similar, but it's a grainless method of producing tone uh, using, uh, uh, because what you do is you put a varnish on the parts of the plate that you want to uh, keep white. Then you put the plate in the acid bath and the acid doesn't affect the protective area. So when you remove it, this is not going to contain um, uh, ink and it's going to remain white. Then you can have other uh, addition. You can, they can sometimes uh, use different techniques on the same plate. So let's look at Los Caprichos. It's a series of 80 etchings.
they show some popular imagery of caricature, uh, but in a very new uh, and inventive forms. Criticism of political, social, and religious abuses. Uh, but this was not made in an organized uh, and coherent structure. We'll see that he, he seems to have had inspiration one by one and not in the proper order. But definitely what is going to be new are his, uh, the techniques that he's going to develop, particularly aquatint. What it does in that series of Los Caprichos is different to what was done where, as we know, in the 17th century, you had had lots of moralizing uh, paintings or uh, engravings that were trying to uh, reform the people and tell them you shouldn't do this. In this case, with uh, Goya, he's doing it in a very dispassionate uh, fashion, if you want. And he, but he does criticize the behavior of human beings, uh, looking at it with kind of a rational way. So this is the first, um, the cover page, if you want, for the Los Caprichos. We see, we'll see different themes. Uh, this is uh, a, a page that actually targets the Godoy, the Prime Minister Godoy, uh, that is going to be, who is going to become the target of uh, Goya's satirical wit in many of the plates. This actually is supposed, seen by other people as being Godoy and the Queen Maria Luisa. Uh, of course, they are mocked by a group, you can see, of older women who uh, are criticizing her unseemly behavior. But I want you to look at the magnificent technique of Goya in the different texture that he uses. So here you see very much the aqua tint, whereas here you have uh, lines that would show that this is done with etching. But this kind of granular uh, texture is very much a uh, part of the aqua tint. But you can see how the line varies. You have a richness of line that uh, is quite wonderful. This one is, is quite interesting and also has to do with uh, Godoy. Godoy would be the, the person who is held by the feet by the giant uh, below. So uh, he's elevated over the globe. Uh, so you see the earth, literally the, the, the earth there by a symbol of lust. Uh, the two falling figures indicate that such successes are transitory and always come at the expenses of others. And it's true, we know that he will be okay until uh, Charles has to abdicate and he's going to follow them, actually, not quite follow them, but also be exiled uh, from uh, Spain. So, subir y bajar, to rise and to fall. This one, hasta la muerte, until death, refers to the Duchess of Osuna, but also the Queen Maria Luisa that were renowned, both of them, for their vanity and their ugliness. You can see she's looking at herself in the mirror and thinking that that beautiful little hat would enhance her beauty. Again, I really want you to look at the, the different textures that uh, Goya gives to the background and then the, the light that he brings at the front. Vola Verunt, Gone for Good, has to do with the Duchess of Alba. Uh, this, of course, there was a time where the Duchess of Alba turned away from Goya, and Goya was very uh, angry about it. Uh, she's here uh, standing proudly on the back of three witch-like figures, and she's flying through the air. Um, now, it looks like the three figures that are down here belong to uh, famous bullfighters of the time. The doll figure of the Duchess appears uh, very reserved and she wears butterfly wings 
as a symbol of unpredictable flightiness in her hair. You can see the butterfly wings here. The title, these titles, by the way, were given by Goya. These are not uh, art historian uh, title. Uh, it refers to uh, something that has flown away and has gone for good. There, there was a significant play, Lo que quería ver, of uh, El Marques de Viena, what the Marques de Viena wanted to see by a Spanish dramatist that used uh, that term in relation with a uh, witchcraft. This shows kind of a bitterly comment of uh, Goya, who was by that time estranged from the Duchess of Alba, and where he wants to uh, show that the, how um, the butterfly winged woman symbolizes female fickleness and inconsistency. Another one, Quien Mas Rendido, uh, which is the more overcome, uh, of course, criticizing, uh, caricature, cari oh, caricaturizing uh, the fact, the courtly uh, manners of the time. Now you can see how it is reproduced with the two little dogs in the lower left corner. Now, not as uh, funny are uh, also some uh, remarks on uh, the um, violence towards women, which uh, Goya was uh, very angry about. And here you see a woman taken away, que uh, la llevaron. So, so they carried her off. Uh, you can see that the perpetrators remain anonymous. One, though, at the back is dressed like a monk and only uh, the woman's head is rendered in details. Again, really appreciate the lines of Goya in his way, and this is all aquatint. He started these uh, Los Caprichos when he was a uh, um, guest at the uh, castle, the, the, the palace of uh, the Duchess of Alba. And so he had access to the domestic side of uh, the uh, household. And so here he's looking at some of women, bien tirada esta. So it is well pulled up. So she's pulled up her stocking really high and you have the old woman looking at that beautiful young uh, woman there. Very light, delicate brushstroke and wash technique uh, that he's using. Now, sometimes also the ridicule of the attitude of women. Ya tienen asiento. Now they are sitting well, where they carry the seat on their head instead of being sitting on. And of course, the guys are having a lot of fun, particularly with uh, showing the fact that they're showing their legs, uh, pulling up their skirt all the way up. Some less funny images are have to do with uh, the Inquisition. In his no remedio, there was no remedy. Uh, this uh, condemned, uh, the, the people that were condemned by the uh, Inquisition were uh, paraded wearing a distinctive conical hat, uh, signaling their disgrace. Uh, as you can see, there they were some uh, comments let's see, some documentation written by a French traveler uh, in Valencia that saw an alleged witch that her up, upper body bared to the waist being led through every quarter of the town. Also, part of the themes were the life and behaviors of the friars. Uh, he was by that time quite uh, anti-clerical things. And this is one of them, están calientes. They are hot, in heat, actually, uh, it means. He depicts, uh, I show you the upper right um, preparatory drawing for the uh, etching that shows actually an even worse uh, rendition of the monks where you have the principal seated uh, figure at the left has a very phallic nose that is supported uh, on a stick so he can stuff himself with a spoon. 
the central uh, monk that you see here holds uh, also a spoon and has that very elongated figure with uh, puffy eyes and a flat nose. This one has a face that looks almost like a skull. And then you have a standing monk behind that holds a bowl of food and looks at the long nose uh, seated monk. This has been rearranged and now we've lost the phallic nose, but we still have two monks with a gaping mouth, another one with a really strange grim on his face. And so um, quite nice. The, the brushwork is very different if you want the technique, uh, but this is a merry caricature showing comments on monastic lust and uh, gluttony. He also imitates fabulous. Uh, he uh, shows the stupidity of the donkey to criticize actually the intellectual profession. So this, in this case, you have uh, donkeys that are an allegory for intellectual profession and uh, teachers, as you can see, the, the, all the donkeys teaching the one, the small one. Si sab jamás el discípulo, might not the pupil know more. Another donkey, uh, often witches uh, were disguised as common physician. Uh, and in the literature of the time, uh, very often uh, you have uh, the, the donkeys represent human. So you have the original, one of the original uh, sketches that he did to end up with the uh, etching that you have on the left, uh, show actually uh, two donkey doctors, a woman and a male patient. So you have the first donkey here at the front, the woman who actually uh, has the features of the Duchess of Alba, putting her head, hand on the shoulder of the donkey. And then the very fancy donkey here, donkey with a, a powdered wig and some glasses that you can see uh, is reading a book probably uh, an idea of the cure that he wants to give don't forget at that, that time um, Goya is going to become sick and he's definitely we know that he faced some uh, pretty quack doctors uh, so for him this has some autobiographical uh, autobiographical uh, reference Now, in the finished product, the Kel, the Kemal Moriha is uh, of what ill will he die, shows actually an excellent doctor, a meditative, reflexive, calm, and serious. So what more can we ask for? One of the masterpieces of that series is the follower. It's uh, the following, uh, El Sueño de la Razón Produce Monstruos the dream of reason produces, produces monsters. This uh, plate was actually going to be the uh, introduction to the series when uh, finally Goya decided to uh, change uh, course and decide to have his self-portrait uh, at, at the front. But this is the one that is always shown when you talk about Los Caprichos. As you can see, the, the, these are two of the many uh, sketches that he did in preparation for the, um, the plate. Uh, they both show a man asleep on a pedestal, if you want, uh, with these uh, series of bats and other uh, cats, you know, all, all these uh, witchcraft animals, uh, and some text written on the pedestal. In the one on the left, the upper left, you have uh, on the upper margin used to appear Sueño one, first dream. Then on the side of the desk or pedestal that is there is written universal language drawn and etched by Francisco de Goya in the year 1797. And there was a bottom um, margin that you don't see here, the author dreaming his only intention is to banish harmful common beliefs 
and to perpetuate with this work of Capriccio's the solid testimony of truth. Now, the final uh, etching, uh, as I mentioned, it was supposed to be on the front shows, uh, the man uh, leaning on the pedestal or the desk, whatever, and just the text has been reduced to El Sueño de la Razón, Produce a Monstros. He's surrounded by bats and, and uh, owls and cats. And uh, this is really the idea of um, um, Goya that says, you know, the, the dream-like appearance of his, uh, the idea of the creative uh, invention to break away from traditional rules of art. Uh, in, in fact, he's so overwhelmed by all the commission that he receives um, from the officials that he's, uh, he just cannot go on. It's a marvelous uh, etching. Then he is going to dedicate many, and from the Capriccio's number 43, uh, it's mostly, uh, mostly words that have to do with witchcraft. So in this case, you have uh, women sinking to their knees in front of a monk's habit. And, uh, but clad in the habit is not a monk, but uh, simply a stunt tree. And it shows how they can easily believe uh, in things as long as some charismatic people have told them what it was. You have also all kind of goblins that are flying in the air. Todos Kairan, all will fall. And uh, this is again uh, a chicken with the head of a man, and they are kind of cleaning his behind. But again, you have uh, all known people around that are flying, and this has to do with uh, definitely some caricature of the uh, contemporary people. Trials. Again, this was uh, quite influenced by many of the plays that were written at the time. Uh, you can see the ram in the background. The young uh, woman there is uh, working on the ears of the man that is supposed to be her husband. You have then in the center that sinister cat looking at you straight on and another cat there, as well as a skull and a pottery. And then on the side, uh, you have the spools that are definitely the symbols of uh, the, the witches. And this one, La Linda Maestra, Pretty Teacher. Uh, this is one of the, the most known too, where you see a young witch uh, who is taught how to fly on the broom by an old witch. Now, uh, in 1803, after he had finished that series, um, he realized that the material he had touched was pretty dangerous and delicate. So what he did is he offered the copper plate, so the very original, and the first edition that was unsold, um, first, sorry, the, the first edition's unsold sets to King Charles IV, which means many had already been sold. Uh, but what was not sold, as well as the original print, are going to uh, become the property of the King Charles IV. Uh, later in life, Goya is going to write that he had felt it prudent to withdraw the prints from circulation due to the Inquisition that was still very, very strong at the time. So now I'm going to uh, give you five minutes to stretch, not more, because we still have quite a bit of material to cover. Uh, stretch, I'm going to unmute you. And if you have questions, I also see that... Um, oh my gosh, I won't even ask how much those bottles cost. Yes. Okay, so 
uh, be aware that we hear you. So let me. Go. I'm glad. If, are you, do you hear me? Yes. I just was able to get on. I've been doing, I kept getting, uh, I was using, I guess, the wrong ID. And it's uh, uh, my fault. I already apologized to the others. Uh, I'm. So disregard my 9 million uh, replies. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So sorry, it's my fault. I'm giving three classes and I gave you the wrong one. <laughs> I was trying to do my very best. Okay. Is there somebody, like Siamara, you say there is a delay between the narration and the frames? Do you all feel that way? No. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, it might be your uh, device, Xiomara. Now, somebody is asking me if it was the Duchess's real hair. Yes, uh, it would be her real hair because it reappears in most of them. She must have had very curly, frizzy hair. <coughs> then it was. Uh, the um, question that the head doesn't belong to the body, that often happens when they uh add the, the head after that and um you know they they paint the body on another model and then they ask the head uh, that can happen Samara, you had a question famous famous Samara, you had a question <laughs> no okay any I, other I, question I, I have a question about the connecting I was told that you, when you invite us in, that we shouldn't have to do the pa ID and password and all that. If I give you three information, you have one link, which is a URL underline. If you click that, you come in straight on. If you join from the app, then you will have to enter the other two numbers. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but it didn't do that when I clicked on the link. I can't help you there. I don't know. Okay. Well, I finally got in one hour later. <laughs> <laughs> you will have, hopefully, this time I will have recorded the... the normally, I, I made sure that it was going to record it and you will get the report. Oh, not to worry. Not to worry. Okay. Other, other questions? I have a question. Uh, why, is, well, we why, have did, to... why did the uh, Duchess of Alba fall out with Goya? He was, you know, first of all, she was a very liberated woman, and uh, he must have been, you know, he was a very passionate man. So, uh, not that he was particularly handsome, but he was well read and uh, had uh, interesting ideas. So, must have been charismatic. No, you don't have to always be very handsome to please a, a pretty woman. But did, did they, they had a falling out. Oh, oh for falling out, you mean? No. Uh, yes, because she, she was, as, as he said, fickle. You know, <laughs> uh, she, don't forget that the distances were big. So when he was not there, she had other men and that's it. So he wasn't too too happy with that, but they, you know, it was such a difference in, in class, in, in layers of society that uh, she would do what she wanted because she had, she was one of the richest women in Spain at that time. And so it, it kind of gave her a lot of power that others didn't have. Hi, Steve. Who has a bird that ch chirps there? Yeah, I can hear. Somebody has a bird. Anne? Yes. May I ask you, uh, I just want to confirm um, that no one else is having this or experiencing a delay between your narration and no, the picture? No, I'm just asking. The people told me no. I am. You this is Marianne, and I'm yes. also having that delay. Yeah, that could yes. be, that might have to do with your Wi-Fi, I would believe. That I don't experience it when I use Zoom and other, uh, for other events. So I I'm only warning you. 
so that you know about it because your narration does not match the picture. And there is like a, a considerable delay until you start with the next um, picture. Okay. Okay, yeah, but thank that you. is one thing. Yes. The other thing that I wanted to check with you was in uh, that point 9.43. Is that date correct, 1995 to 98? I'm not sure what you are talking about. Yeah, 9.43 from the list. Yes. Oh, no, of course not 1995. No, no, sorry. It's uh, 1795. That's okay, okay so, thank you so much. I was just wondering. No, thank you. Yeah, that's what the I, what yeah. I see currently on the screen is 9.42 is that what i should yes, it is it is you know, but he's referring to the list i sent you yes a few days ago the list of yeah. illustrations so she printed the list and she can see what's coming next we just it's saw the bird, the bird chirping we can all talk at the same time that's interesting so we have one of our uh uh, participants who, uh, whose grandmother uh, was the head teacher of the Alameda Versuda School. So there is a, uh, and the building is part of the Osuna Palace and the El Capricho Garden. So we have people directly um, involved in all that history. Okay, so we're going to go on. I'm going to mute you again because otherwise I hear you birds and you uh, moving. <laughs> I mute you all. Nice on the it's patio. The bird. I saw the bird. Okay, we'll see. We'll talk uh, at the end. Okay. Okay. So the next uh, few images are going to be some a portrait that he did uh, in that period. And as uh, somebody mentioned, this is not 1995. Of course, it's 1795 to 98. The beautiful portrait of Matador Pedro Romero, who was one of the greatest toreador of all times, was absolutely idolized for his courage and control, as well as you can see a very handsome appearance. Uh, he was uh, one of the uh, foremost exponents of the classical school of bullfighting established by his family in Ronda in Andalusia. Uh, he posed for Goya shortly before he retired from the bullring in 1799 at the age of 45. As you can see, um, the costume is not overwhelming. I, when I was in Spain, in Madrid uh, many years ago, we were staying at the same hotel as many of the uh, bullfighters. And uh, one day we were going out and we saw that the whole gathering and there were three of these guys with their most extraordinary costume, full of gold and red uh, at the door with all the journalists around them taking pictures. They, they were considered as gods. Uh, Romero was said to have killed over 5,000 bulls without suffering injuries to himself. He relied only on the skill of his and agility of his maneuvers and his elegant use of the cape, killing the animal with a single sword thrust. He was asserting that a bullfighter should rely not on his feet, but on his hands. And in the ring, when confronting the bull, he must kill or be killed before running or showing fear. Another magnificent uh, portrait is Doña Isabel de Porcel uh, by Goya. Both her husband, um, her husband Don Antonio, and her were very close friends of Goya. And he painted both their portraits as. Um, in gratitude for their hospitality when he stayed at their place. Unfortunately, the husband's portrait uh, was destroyed by fire. Here, it's interesting. We've talked about that last time, and we've heard, used the, the term Maha uh, in this uh, presentation too. She's dressed like a Maha. 
uh, that costume that was originally from the lower class people, particularly in Andalusia, had been adopted by that time uh, as a token of Spanish patriotism. And of course, uh, the way she holds the mantilla that she has in her hair and the, uh, the way she holds her arms would not have been accepted except in the context of her uh, wearing the costume of a maja, maja. Uh, otherwise it would have been uh, deemed an, uh, vulgar, literally. He emphasizes her beautiful eyes and the very fresh coloring. It's, it's an extraordinary uh, work, I think, that she really comes alive. He is going to portray uh, different Mahas. You see, uh, Mahas, this is a little bit a recall of what we have seen in the first part, where you see the two uh, men with uh, the, the, the hat that by now is not uh, with the, the large brim, but is uh, raised, and the cape, and you have that kind of mystery in the back and the very pretty girls with their mantillas uh, at the front. Somebody had asked me where, um, what, where was the majority of uh, Goya's work in the US? And I will say it is at the Met. There are few works, but not too many at uh, the National Gallery, but uh, there is quite a bit, this one included at the Metropolitan. Now, uh, we've seen that early on, uh, Goya has made some religious painting, and including in the ceiling uh, of the uh, Basilica in Saragossa. Uh, he is going to uh, do now some, uh, paint some uh, uh, frescoes in, uh, in the uh, San Antonio de la Florida in Madrid. So here is the ceiling showing the miracle of St. Anthony. And he's all surrounding that, that uh, cupola, giving you a feeling that people are, are just, surround, are just uh, surrounding the top of the building and then that this is the heavens. And here is a detail. You can see the quickness of the brush, really very uh, quick brushwork there. Miracle of St. Anthony. Now, go, to go on, we have to talk about a little bit of the historical background again. In 1799, Napoleon will become first consul of the French Republic will be crowned or crowns himself actually emperor in 1804. He had eyes on Spain, as I mentioned to you, because Spain controlled the access to the Mediterranean. So he's going to convince the prime minister Godoy to join France in invading Portugal. This was a ploy, of course. By November 1807, 25,000 French troops entered Spain. That's a lot of people. In 1808, there was a popular uprising. Uh, they captured Godoy and forced Carlos to abdicate. Uh, and then his son, Fernando VII, is going to become king only for a few months, 1808, because uh, until May 1808. By, 18, uh, by uh, end of May, uh, Napoleon sees that uh, Fernando is not doing what he wants, and so he pushes his brother to become king as Jose I, and he will reign for uh, five years. A very interesting um, happening in 1812 is that as a reaction to the uh, French invasion, uh, a lot of important people, including some of the ministers uh, that had been very instrumental um, in, in the uh, managing the, uh, Spain, if you want, uh, decided to write a new constitution. Uh, and in 1812, that constitution was uh, ad 
uh, sworn on by the group was uh, informally named La Pepa. Uh, that constitution was uh, extremely modern for the time. And we're going to look a little bit closer once I show you the paintings uh, that uh, refer to it. Uh, but unfortunately, it only lasted for two years because when uh, Ferdinand comes back, he's going to quickly realize that he had no interest in having that constitution and he's going to cancel it. For Goya, uh, that was a dream because he was dreaming of Spain as being a democratic political system, which Napoleon was trying to push on the other side too. He also wanted a secular political system, they want to be cut away from the church. Uh, however, uh, this didn't materialize and he um, compromised and remained the court painter. Just to remind you how powerful Spain was at that time. Uh, here you have an idea of uh, what were the territories of Spain uh, at the time of the uh, writing of the Constitution of 1812. So it had more than half of South America, all Central America, and the whole <coughs> Western part of the US. Including, of course, territories in Africa, uh, the Canary Island, they still belong to them. And then you had the whole the Philippines uh, island uh, on the east. So this is a, a painting by Vin Vicente Lopez y Portaña of Ferdinando VII, uh, was king of Spain in 1808 for just a couple of months and then uh, came back after uh, Bonaparte left in from 1813 to 1833. He was known um, to his supporters as the desired El Deseado and to his detractor as the felon king, El Rey Felon. Um, he reestablished the absolute monarchy and rejected that liberal constitution of 1812 that we talk about it. He also suppressed the liberal press, 1814 to 33, and jailed many of his editors and writers. But unfortunately, at his death, Spain entered civil war. Here is by uh, Baron, the Baron Gérard, a very known French painter, a portrait of uh, Joseph Bonaparte as King of Spain. Then Goya made a, a few paintings of uh, people that helped actually kick out the French, and this is the Duke of Wellington. Uh, this is actually the only Englishman that was painted by Goya. He was the victor of the Battle of Salamanca uh, when he liberated Madrid from the French. He has the insignia of the Golden Fleece that you can see here, which actually was a, uh, an award only given to, it was created by the Duke of the Burgundy and then became part of the, the uh, Habsburg uh, family, if you want, but only a few were uh, given. He also showed the decoration of three orders, the Bath, topmost star, the Tor and Sword of Portugal, and San Fernando of Spain. And here is the portrait by Goya of General Nicolas Gui, uh, who was a Napoleonic uh, general who uh, advised uh, Joseph Napoleon in Spain during the occupation. After the expulsion of the Napoleonic armies, uh, Goya applied for a grant to paint two very iconic paintings that had to do with uh, that uh, war. So he applied for a grant, an official uh, official financial aid to perpetuate with the brush the most notable and heroic actions or scenes of a glorious insurrection against the tyrant of Europe. Uh, these, this is one of the two. The other one is more famous. This one is not as much, but it shows the people of Madrid armed with knives and rough weapons attacking um, 
group of mounted Egyptian soldier, soldiers uh, called the Mamluks. And the cuirass, cuirass, sorry, cuirass here of uh, the Imperial Army that you can see here. So this doesn't uh, emphasize a single action, but rather a, a very moving, full of energy type of, of movement. More known is a painting that was done at about the same time. It's called the second, the, the third of May, the previous one being the second of May, and shows the third of May, the execution of the defenders of Madrid. Um, this was the that insurrection insurrection uh, of the people insurrection of the people of Madrid against the Napoleonic uh, army was savagely punished by arrest and uh, almost direct execution uh, the following uh, morning. It is there is a legend that uh, Goya attended assisted. Um, witness the, this execu execution on the hill of Principe Pio on the outskirt of Madrid. But more probable is the fact that uh, he was told and went to visit the spot immediately afterwards and made sketches of the bodies around that. Uh, here the drama is, is, is quite amazing. You have that central figure here in white, the only real bright color in the scene that holds his hands up and apart, uh, almost like a Christ-like figure. Uh, he's on his knees. Uh, you have a uh, monk next to him who is already falling. Very interesting too how you see all the soldiers there are anonymous. You can't see their face uh, and they direct their rifle to the, to the crowd. And of course you have the gore, all the blood around that. An enormous lantern, this is here, is the only point of a source of light. So this was a, quite an inspiration. It's something that's going to be uh, influential on um, Manet, who is going to do the execution of uh, the Archduke uh, Maximilian, the em Emperor Maximilian by that time in uh, Mexico. Uh, but uh, a very, very powerful painting that also brings a very modern look at uh, painting done in the early part of the 19th century. This, this is so revolutionary in the way it is handled. Also part of that uh, period is that amazing painting of the Colossus. Uh, showing an enormous uh, figure there uh, in the nude that emerges from behind that hill. And the whole series of, of uh, carts and, and uh, people and animals fleeing the scenes. So a lot of people are wondering uh, what it really meant. So there are different theories on um, the meaning of that painting. And first of all, for quite a, a long time, and even by now, that painting has been uh, disputed. And not everybody agreed that Goya is the original painter of, the paint, of uh, that painting. By the way, I think you're going to see in the list of illustrations that I've added some uh, works. That's why you have a 953.a, is because I worked on it after having sent the, the list to everybody. So I, I did uh, insert some other paintings too. So uh, the painting was thought to, at, uh, for a while, at least even the Prado Museum where it resides, uh, believed that it was painted by a student and follower of Goya. Uh, but uh, Juan Bautista Ariasa, uh, no, sorry, not, not uh, him, that's another. Um, I will come back with the name. The, so that, that uh, painter painted very much in the manner of uh, Goya, but uh, bringing the, the great specialist of uh, Goya, who is Nigel Glendinning, 
uh, looked at many different works by Goya, including the giant that you see here on the left, uh, that etching shows a very similar body as well as the head uh, in that um, etching called the giant, uh, also called the Colossus. And we can see a similarity between these two. Now, what does it mean? You have that stream of people fleeing with their cattle. I'm going to show you here an idea. And you can see again how very quickly the paint is applied, uh, the, the lighter. The only one that is not fleeing is that donkey. And you see the donkey there who is uh, staying. And uh, people say this could be a symbol for incredulous people. So what does it refer to? And uh, they, they are different theories. Uh, one is that uh, it is relying on a poem written by Juan Bautista Arias called Pyrenean Prophecy, uh, where the, the poem represents the Spanish people as a giant arising from the Pyrenees in order to oppose the Napoleonic invasion. Uh, this is probably the, the most believable uh, story. But uh, what is quite interesting is also the fact uh, that it anticipates the black paintings that will come later. Where does the body of uh, the uh, Colossus come from? There are two possible sources. A engraving by Hendrik Goltzius, the Dutch uh, uh, artist that um, Gautius had made of the Farnese Hercules. And we can see some similarity with that, but also uh, Francisco de Surbaran did a whole series of the, work, the labors of Hercules that uh, were at the Buen Retiro and uh, that um, Goya had seen multiple times. So there might be a dual influence there. Moving to the Los Desastres de la Guerra, uh, this is the other series, 82 prints created between 1810 and 1820, was published in 1863, only 35 years after his death, and you will probably understand why. The real title was Fatal Consequences of Spain's Bloody War with Bonaparte and Other Emphatic Caprices. Um, he uses the intaglio printmaking technique, so etching for the line work, but also aquatint as he did before, engraving. So sometimes he will, after uh, having the plate um, in the acid, he brings it out, he's going to correct it with engraving and sometimes emphasize some lines with a dry point, which brings that blur line. Composition, the first 47, focus on incidents from the war and show the consequences of the conflict on individual soldiers and civilians. Uh, very, very hard to look at. Then famine from plate 48 to 64 record the effects of the famine that hit Madrid in 1811 and 12. And then finally, the final 17 are going to reflect the bitter disappointment of liberals when they restored Bourbon monarchy encouraged by the Catholic hierarchy, rejected the Spanish constitution of 1812 and opposed both state and religious reform. This is uh, what I had mentioned uh, before. These were also probably influenced by some of the woodblocks by the French artist Jacques Callot. Jacques Callot had made a whole series, Les Grandes Misères de la Guerre, The Great Miseries of the War. They are so graphic. This one is a good example of La Pendaison, The Hanging. Now, much more sophisticated are Goya's. Uh, this is woodblock, so this is a, a, a more uh, early type of technique. But here is the first work. This is the plate uh, number one, 
a mournful foreboding of what is to come. Uh, in these early uh, uh, plates, you see that Goya is really showing his sympathy uh, with the Spanish defenders. Then um, you see different, um, in an evolution in the way he looks at that. And as the series progresses, the distinction between the Spanish and the imperialist become quite ambiguous. Here it's a beautiful scene. You have a feeling of somebody on his knees that praying it could, it, with another context, uh, be a, a painting of St. Jerome or, or San Francis. Of course, with this, uh, with the invasion came looting and uh, raping, of course. And this is uh, one, no uh, quieren, they do not want to, where you see a soldier is there taking a woman and you have the older woman that is wielding a knife in defense of the young woman. Beautiful again, the, the, the way he treats uh, this, this is all aqua tint, but uh, aqua tint then superimposes with lines that uh, are done. So it's probably done in two or three stages. This is one of the most cruel that I've seen in the aftermath of battle. The mutilated torsos and limbs of civilian victims were mounted on trees like fragments of marble sculpture. Esto es peor, this is worse. Absolutely horrible. To me, I, that image has followed me for an incredible amount of time. It's so cruel. Yolovi, I saw this. Uh, here you have the, the people that are fleeing. Uh, the soldiers. Esto es malo, this is bad. Um, this is one of the, the rare sympathetic images of clergy that shown on the side of uh, oppression and injustice. The monk is killed by French soldiers who are looting the church treasures. You can see this, the bag down here with all the, the looting. No llegan a tiempo, they do not arrive in time. This now has to do with the effects of the famine, which ravaged Madrid from uh, August 11, 1811 until uh, Wellington armies liberated the city in August 12. Starvation killed over 20,000 people in the city that year. The famine was a result of many factors. First of all, the French invaders and Spanish guerrillas and bandits blocked the pass and roads into the city. So you couldn't provision, uh, you couldn't uh, provide the food. Uh, but um, it's, it had a terrible effect on population. In this case, you have two women, one with a child in her arms uh, that are huddling be behind the ruins of a building to lay a third man to rest on the ground. La cam Las camas de la muerte, the beds of death. A woman is walking past dozens of rat bodies awaiting burial. Nothing, the event will tell. Uh, this is a, a rather uh, interesting um, etching. It's part of a, a series between plate 65 and 82 that were called the Caprichos Emphaticos, Emphatic Caprices, uh, in the original series title. It, they were completed between 1813 and 20 and spanning uh, the, the fall of Ferd Ferdinand VII in his return to power. This is difficult to see, but you have a woman who is here, who is writing uh, a book while holding scales in her left hand. She's apparently uh, reason. She represents the reason 
protected by justice and progress. She opposes the force of darkness, but in the foreground you have the allegorical image of man who has suffered the dire consequences of the war and the restoration of absolutism. He's lying on the ground, he scrolls the word nothing on the sheet of paper. And this etching plays on the hope that after this, we shall finally learn the truth. This one, El Buitre Carnivoro, the flesh-eating vulture. You see that big bird that is pushed by the fork of a uh, um, man behind. So obviously the population and you have monks and others in the background. I think it, they symbolize the, the, the Bourbon or Napoleon, actually, it should be too, because that was the eagle. Contra el bien general against the common good, <clears throat> you have a monstrous winged devil here, sits upon a rock and writes a book, perhaps a book of fate, a book of evil. And he has clawed feet, as you can see. May the rope break. Uh, sorry, I don't have the Spanish uh, title for that, that one. I don't know why. But uh, this was originally showing, showing the Pope uh, walking on the rope and everybody down below hoping that the, pope, that the, the rope would break. Uh, this was uh, modified to show just a single cleric at that time. Uh, the Pope that would have been identified as uh, Pius VII uh, wore the papal tiara. <coughs> Goya incriminates here the fact that the Catholic Church was an accomplice to, in the restoration of absolutism in Spain. Towards the end of uh, the disasters of the, the war are three very interesting uh, etchings. The first one is Truth Has Died, Morio La Verdad. Uh, this are uh, showing a the burial of a beautiful young woman. And this will be followed by her exhumation or resurrection. The priest is administering the last rite, as you can see in the center here. It's actually more than a priest, he's a bishop. In the following print, you have, will she rise again? Si resucitaria. Um, there she's exposed her radiance and beauty uh, faded and she's aged but she, emits, she still emits a glow that seems uh, absolutely overwhelming. Despite the fact that this was one of the most significant anti-war works of art, the disaster of war had no impact on the European consciousness for two generations. It's only outside of Spain that uh, this was uh, really uh, marking and uh, it was published by the Royal Academy in San Fernando in 1863, long time after uh, Goya had died, but it really impacted uh, countries like France and Germany in the quality of uh, his work. Now the last um, plate shows also uh, Esto es la verdadero, this is the truth and seems to be the conclusion where that young woman seems to have resuscitated and is appearing to that uh, shepherd, the sheep and dogs around. Just the idea they want the truth to be still there. One of the, the painting that I added at the last minute, I haven't even numbered it, is the allegory of the constitution of 1812. Uh, by Goya, completely different style, by the way, of his. 
uh, that really stresses uh, the con that famous constitution of 1812, where you see constitution there holding the book. Her arm is held by time, the allegory of time. And then uh, one uh, young woman uh, is writing some more in the, at the front. This is uh, much more traditional in the way uh, of painting. So what did that constitution stresses? It stressed the separation of the power of the executive and legislative, legislative branches of government. The Cortes, which is the parliament in Spain, was to be elected by universal suffrage or by, by an indirect method. Each member of the Cortes was to represent 70,000 people. The members of the Cortes were to meet in annual sessions. The king was prevented from either convening or proroguing the Cortes. And very interesting, the members of the Cortes were to serve single two, years, two year terms and they could not serve consecutive terms. They also, uh, what was interesting, they wanted to allow people of uh, mixed heritage. Uh, that means people, some of the people that were coming from the new world that had settled in Spain to be considered as a citizen of Spain. They also wanted Spain to become a federation. So you had the territory of Spain and you had all the other territories would have reported to Spain, but would have had their uh, particular government. So this was extremely avant-garde, if you can say. Uh, many other, I'm really summarizing. Just to show you the difference between this allegory by Goya of the Constitution of 1812, here is a much more traditional view of the promulgation of the Constitution of 1812 by Salvador Vinegra that shows uh, the, the typical um, history paint, painting. Coming back to Goya, uh, he did a series of um, etchings on Tohomakia. Uh, these were, he did uh, at the age of 60 during a break uh, in the middle of his famous series, The Disaster of War. He was attracted by the uh, Tohomakia, as you know, he tried himself when he was young uh, many times. And so he is showing El Cid Campeador, Lanceando Otro Toro. Uh, the Cid Campeadors were, of course, the great um, hero that is buried in uh, Burgos uh, that uh, was so dear to the history of, uh, of Spain. Here's another one. Tigresa y atrevimiento de Juanito Apinani en la de Madrid, la Tahomaquia. Again, this shows the agility and athleticism of some of these um, men. He made then a series for Manuel Garcia de la Prada. These are um, much more, much closer to what he had done in the cartoons for tapestries. This is the burial of the sardine. Um, they, this was a carnival parade that parodies a funeral procession and culminates with the burning of a symbolic figure, usually a representation of a sardine. And so um, this is celebrated on Ash Wednesday. A village bullfight. Actually, it was interesting because at that time, Charles III had Im Im imposed the restrictions on uh, bullfighting. It was banned in 1808, but then the ban was lifted by Joseph Bonaparte. Again, another scene of the madhouse one of the many, and you, you can see a sympathy in the sense of uh, Goya who had a lifelong concern for the plight of the insane as well as of prisoners. 
but he's really interested in the physiognomy of all these figures. Another painting, the Inquisition Tribunal. Inquisition was introduced in Spain in the 15th century. And this was a court run by the church and intended to protect the monarchy. The last the public auto da fe, so there's one of these uh, public uh, event, if you want, was staged in Madrid in 1874. And the uh, Inquisition was abolished only in the early 20th century, officially. Here you can see the tribunal and the famous conical hat uh, worn by different defendants. Here is a procession of flagellant. Uh, this is of, um, during the, the Holy Week. You have, and it still exists, by the way, the flagellant, but not doing it as bloody as, as you can see. They only wear the costume is also conical hats. Uh, they are also called the Nazarenes. And these are part of these very uh, amazing procession uh, during the whole uh, week before Eastern. In that case, they were still doing uh, public penance with flagellating themselves, and this was pretty, uh, pretty bad. Now, in 18, um, oh, sorry. In 1822, uh, Goya decided to leave uh, his house in Madrid and to move into uh, the uh, Quinta del Sordo, which was, uh, you can see the, the, the building on the left, photograph in 1900. This was situated on the hill of the old uh, municipality of Cajabonchel on the outskirts of Madrid. It uh, had the name of uh, Quinta del Sordo, which means the, the house of the, the deaf, not because of Goya, but because of previous owner who also uh, was deaf. The house was initially composed of just two main rooms, each measuring uh, about nine by four and a half meter, and was decorated with rural motifs. Uh, then Goya added a new wing for the kitchen, and he lived there until his exile, self-imposed exile to Bordeaux in 24. Now, just a year after purchasing the, the, the house in 22, he decided to paint it. And I, I was really lucky in finding that uh, graphic that shows you the inside of the house, the two floors, uh, and uh, how the paintings used to belong to that. We're very lucky that uh, these paintings uh, are still there because there was at the time uh, an idea of just taking the house down, paintings or no paintings. So they were able to remove these paintings and they are now uh, all in the Prado. Very uh, different kind of paintings, I'm not showing them all, but uh, very dark. That's why they're called the black painting. This is uh, the witch's Sabbath, also uh, known as the great he -God. Uh, In uh, Spanish, it's the Aquelar, el, el Gran Cabron are also uh, some of the names for these, where you see again the witch uh, represented by the ram, and then you have all these women around that are just participating to it, with the exception of this one, who doesn't seem to believe uh, into uh, what's happening at all. But that time, Goya was 75 years old. He was living alone and was suffering from a serious acute mental and physical distress. This is seen as a satire of the credulity of the age, a condemnation of superstition and uh, also condemnation of uh, what was uh, happening at the witch trials. 
in the Spanish Inquisition. Now, when the painting uh, was found, it was much bigger, as you can see on the top. This is an original photograph of that painting. And you can see the person who was in charge of restoring it cut uh, two large segments on either end of it, which completely changes the balance, if you want, of the composition. In fact, as you can see, she's much more prominent there than she is now, where she's marginalized. The next one, La Romeria de San Isidro, a pilgrimage to San Isidro, uh, was originally on the ground floor of La Quinta. Um, it filled a whole wall opposite to the she goat, the he goat, sorry. Uh, it was, the house was not too far from the hermitage of San Isidro. And uh, so he himself had painted one of the cartoons for the tapestries about that uh, feast day. So this is kind of a, a complement to what he had. You see a singer here at the very front and um, uh, the, just the, the queue of people that are moving towards uh, the monastery. Somebody, uh, Jerry, can you mute yourself, please? Thank you. The very known painting here on the left is uh, Saturn devouring one of his children, uh, refers back to the Greek mythology where you know that Saturn and uh, Gaia uh, were married, but he had had a dream that uh, one of his children were going to um, topple him and uh, take over the, the power. And so as soon as one of his children was born, he would immediately devour it. So this is a, a direct reflection to that terrible story of the beginning of the world, in a sense. Uh, this is probably the cruelest of the black paintings. It's so nightmarish and gives you just an idea of uh, Goya's state of mind at that time. Now just um, not far from there is that other painting of the dog that is quite uh, interesting because we don't know exactly what happens. That dog, only the head appears, but you have really the feeling that the, the, the dog is uh, drowning. There are other paintings, and I'm not showing you by, for the sake of time. Uh, one more series of etchings was done by him, and I'm only showing you one of them uh, because I think it's uh, very representative of the series. Uh, it was uh, called Los Disparates, um, and um, in includes a whole series of very dreamlike figures, and it's not very sure what they represent. Here you have Modo de Volar, a way of flying uh, that is, is probably the most known of all these, but give you a sense of uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci uh, reborn. Quite interesting to see how they're pushing with their feet. They can uh, also manipulate the wings. He made that very interesting self-portrait with Dr. Arrieta. Uh, this, uh, Dr. Arrieta was a friend of his, and you can see him holding a glass to his mouth. Uh, in the background, you have these very nightmarish uh, images that probably are figures that were populating the, the nightmares of Goya, who was known to, to have terrible night. But here we see a very sympathetic uh, rendition of a doctor that he really cared for. He really esteemed him uh, quite a bit. He also did, uh, in his spare time, uh, we can see some uh, still lifes. You have dead birds on the left and uh, three, still lifes, three salmon steaks, uh, where suddenly the color comes back. And I think it's, it's a beautiful rendering of the 
the, the color of salmon or the, the rooster, the red rooster. He went on making some portraits. He is uh, Mariano Goya on the left, uh, who is his grandson, the son of uh, Javier. And then a little eight, uh, later, Mariano Goya, he, in 27, that was when he was in Bordeaux already. In 1823, uh, Goya decided that his life is in danger and that he has to leave Spain. It's a really difficult thing for him to do. Uh, he is uh, through and through a, a Spaniard, uh, but he knows that uh, having worked for uh, Joseph Napoleon and having criticized the church, etc., etc. Uh, he might be in trouble. He had been called in front of the Inquisition, as you know, for the paintings of the Machas. And uh, so he decides to uh, move to uh, Bordeaux. But at first, pushed by many of his friends, he decides he wants to go to Paris. He had never been to Paris, and that was the place to go. So on his way, uh, to Bordeaux, he's going to first, he pretends, by the way, he gets a permission to leave Spain with the idea that he's going to go to the, what was called the waters or the bath for his health in the Jura. The Jura is the northeast of France. That was much too far. So he goes to Paris and then comes back to Bordeaux and he's going to stay in Bordeaux until his death in 28. He is, um, he can never completely leave Spain. So he's gonna go back and forth a couple of times. He's still paid, he's still the uh, first court painter to the king. And so gets a pension from, from the, the king and this is what he lives on. Uh, so he wants to make sure that any money that he's due is gonna come to him because he's close to, to poverty, literally. But by that time, too, uh, there is another woman in his life. Um, Josefa has died, absolutely run down by the multiple pregnancies. And he has met uh, a faraway cousin who he likes. And uh, she's going to be part of his life uh, together with uh, the two children that she had probably one from her husband and probably the other one from Goya. Leocadia was very important in his life though, interestingly enough, uh, Goya will not provide for her after his death. So she's not part of her uh, testament and uh, only the son, uh, Javier, is going to uh, receive the money and Leocadia is going to die really in poverty. This is one of the lovely painting he made, the milkmaid of Bordeaux, which was actually in, um, in Spanish is La Lecheria de Bordeaux. When it was purchased by an Englishman, he, think, he thought they made a, a, a wrong assumption on her and said the lechery of Bordeaux and so uh, cons uh, qualified her as prostitute, which it had nothing to do, lecherie, I mean, the milkmaid, actually. Beautiful technique, very fast brushwork, and shows the modernity of uh, Goya. He is a late self-portrait, uh, made in 1796-97, can be compared by a painting by Vicente Lopez y Portaña of uh, Goya in 1826. And we have to uh, realize how difficult life was since uh, 1792 for Goya, who found himself completely isolated from people around him because he couldn't hear that. 
he had to deal with them by uh, signs or sometimes people had to write papers in front of him to, for him to understand. And I find that that self-portrait here could be almost compared to the Beethoven, uh, one of the most famous uh, portrait of Beethoven who suffered from the same ailment. So uh, Goya had lost faith uh, and was uh, in the restored Spanish monarchy because they had rejected uh, the uh, constitution of uh, 1812 that he was giving a lot of credit to. Uh, so uh, he, when he stayed in Bordeaux, he, he really struggled. He finally died of a stroke in 1828 at the age of 82. Um, he was buried over there. Apparently uh, he was unwell for uh, many uh, weeks and then he was half paralyzed and finally died of um, the, the stroke. And one of the last works that he did is Aun Aprendo, I'm still learning, aren't we all? We're all still learning and we sympathize with Goya and I hope you have enjoyed this um, this class and that you've learned about as we know about no one is going into the museum. Okay, about uh, I, uh, well, yeah, so in case you wrote a check for your membership and it hasn't been cashed, that's why because okay, you know, I, be careful, we can hear you every day. So, and you know, yes. The checks are sitting. So the, the next, the next class like will be uh, about mostly talking to Hoya. Please, so somebody, somebody, stop me. Get cash, excuse me. Delay in that. excuse me. There, could you mute yourself, so please? Unknowns, Hello. There's oh. unknowns with the pilots. So we yeah, I don't know who's. Um, Anne, I sent you yeah. a question in the.